House Republicans are imploding and openly revolting. Today, the conference traveling to West Virginia for their annual policy retreat. But fewer than 100 members are even attending the event. That's less than half of the conference. One lawmaker telling Axios, quote, I'd rather sit down with Hannibal Lecter and eat my own liver. And now the GOP majority is shrinking even more. Colorado Republican Ken Buck is announced, Buck, announcing that he's leaving Congress in just a matter of days, torching his party on the way out. What has frustrated you so much about this era of, of politics and this, and particularly Congress? What's made it so difficult? You really need me to say that. <laughs> you, you need me well, to explain what's so difficult about this place. This place just keeps going downhill, and, and I don't need to spend my time here. A lot of this is personal, and that's the problem. Instead of having decorum, instead of uh, operating in a professional manner, this place has just evolved into this bickering and, and nonsense. Another congressman, Chip Roy, also slamming his own party for failing to act on the border. In 2018, we had the House, we had the Senate, we had the White House, and we had a bigger majority than we have today, and we utterly failed to secure the border. Totally dropped the ball. Joining me now is Jonathan Capehart, the host of MSNBC's The Sunday Show with Jonathan Capehart and The Saturday Show with Jonathan Capehart, I might add, and The Washington Post associate editor and Caddy Kay, BBC News U.S. special correspondent. My thanks to both of you for joining me. Jonathan, I'd love to start with you. Thanks, how much of the GOP's, hello, how much of the GOP's paralysis, in your opinion, comes from Trump's just total domination of the party now or from a lack of spine. I feel like we see these things like Ken Buck saying what he's saying now, Jonathan, and yet it seems to be too little too late because he's saying it on the way out. Uh, he's saying it on the way out, but that's not because he wasn't trying to get stuff done. Um, I think it's both. I think it is a lack of spine um, uh, on the part of Speaker Johnson and, and his leadership team, but it also speaks to Donald Trump's influence, not just over Speaker Johnson, who he talks to on a regular basis, but also on the part of the Senate. The Senate was putting together probably the most conservative immigration bill in decades, negotiated by one of the most conservative members of the Senate, Oklahoma Senator James Langford. And Donald Trump picks up the phone or goes out on his social media platform and says, don't do it. Don't vote for the bill. And the senators don't. It doesn't even get out of the Senate to go to the House where Speaker Johnson was was already saying he was going to kill it. And so this just speaks to Donald Trump's complete takeover of the Republican Party in the House, in the Senate. Um, the Republican National Committee, and some some could argue the Supreme Court, but maybe I shouldn't go that far. <laughs> Caddy Kay, could these members that are not going to the retreat we just talked about at the beginning of the segment, could them not going to this retreat be seen as a sign of Speaker Johnson's weakness? I mean, really, it's hard to imagine that this would ever happen under Kevin McCarthy's tenure. Yeah, I mean, look, the Greenbrier Hotel in West Virginia is a nice hotel. I've been there. It's hard to imagine that they're not going because they don't want to go and spend time at the Greenbrier. They're not going, as that anonymous member of Congress, Republican, said, because they don't want to spend time with each other because there is so much. We talk about the dysfunction between and the polarization between the Democratic and the Republican parties, but you look within the Republican Party, there is so much polarization within that group that these members really don't have very much in common with each other. I mean, it might not have helped that the star speaker, Larry Kudlow, dropped out at the last minute. I don't know if that was partly what it was. But when you have members of Congress saying, listen, my big fear is being primaried from the right, not by somebody who I disagree with on policy, but because they want somebody who they say we have to shout and scream more. Well, shouting and screaming doesn't suit many members of these Congress. They don't come to Washington to shout and scream. They try to come to Washington to get things done. And if you look at any bar chart of the amount of bills that have been passed last year in Congress, it falls off a cliff. I mean, it's, it's the lowest number in decades. And that is intensely frustrating, as clearly Ken Buck thinks. You know, Jonathan, to Caddy's point, they may not like each other. And yet, for some reason, when there's a common denominator behind which they can unite, they seem to get their, you know what, together 
to be able to do that, you had an exclusive interview sit down with President Joe Biden immediately after he had delivered that really fiery State of the Union speech. And you asked him about the GOP and, and its response to the threat that Putin is posing not only to Ukraine, but to democracy at large. And we wanted to take a quick listen to what President Biden had to say in response. Well, I think some of them still do stand for it, but they're pretty much intimidated by Trump right now. Yesterday, he spends the time at his mansion with uh, at his resort with Orban. He talks about his great respect for, you know, the president of North Korea. I mean, he praises Putin. I mean, it's, it's a different world. Jonathan, I know you yourself have had the, the privilege of having conversations with Ruth ben Giad and others and to talk about how Trump sees himself in such an authoritarian light. But like I just said, the GOP figures it out, though, when they can get together and, and not pass aid packages to help Ukraine, right, holding that hostage because of border deals. How much should Americans be concerned that the GOP actually views Putin as an ideological ally at this point? Well, I mean, I think the, the evidence of that is very clear. Part of the, the question that I asked the president was, how did it feel for him to, you know, talk about uh, protecting democracy, um, talk about the threat that Russia poses, talk about the threat to our own democracy? How did it feel to say all these things to in front of a party where they used to believe in those things? And, you know, for him, that's what's so galling. We used to know what the Republican Party stood for. And the Republican Party that uh, we grew up around, meaning two terms of Reagan, a term of H.W. Bush, or two, ter uh, two terms of W., you know, Russia was was not a friend. Putin was not someone we could do, we, we learned over and over and over again, couldn't do business with. And so I, I think with the president's fiery State of the Union address, his multiple speeches about the threats to American democracy at home, but also abroad. Yes, the American people should be very worried about a second Trump White House, because he's making it very clear that if he gets another term, there will be lots of meetings and lots of phone calls and, and lots of backslapping with leaders of North Korea, uh, of, of Russia, Russia taking over, uh, taking over Ukraine, Orban be, being even more ascendant. It'll be a rogues gallery of, of, I can't even, get the words out of my mouth and say rogues rogues gallery of american allies but they would be american allies who are anti-democratic